Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my guest today is David Saunders. Um, David, could you introduce yourself? Uh, give us a little background on your years of quality experience and um, eventually we'll talk about sustainability. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for reaching out to me. I'm so glad to be here. So I started my quality journey back in the days of uh, quality circles. Um, I've been working for the mayor of Baltimore and the manpower programs when Ronald Reagan became president before many of you were born. <laughs> um, he then cut the programs and I had to reinvent myself. And in those days, quality circles was the, was the big news. And I tracked down the first quality circle facilitator at Westinghouse and I interviewed them and I learned about quality circles. And uh, I had an organizational development background. I had a master's in urban planning and um, I got into that field. And then luckily along the way, I actually met Dr. Deming personally. I got invited to his lectures and I became wow. a devotee of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Um, I became a coach in his workshops and I became an apprentice to Bill Latso, who was one of um, Deming's real protégés. Uh, Bill Latsko is the one who suggested to Dr. Deming that um, drive out fear should be one of Deming's points, and that became point number eight. Mm. And another time, I'll be very happy to do a podcast just on on Dr. Deming. That'd be great. Um, yeah. So then we we developed the company I was with. Um, we specialized in the voice of the customer. Before it was called voice of the customer, we had a product called Customer Window, and we taught engineers, quality engineers how to conduct customer studies. We wrote an article in Quality Progress in 1987 called Customer wow. Window. Um, Intel called us right away. They bought the license, the program, and taught it at Intel for 20 years. So we had a good run with that. The company was purchased, and then I became a inside guy. I was no longer a consultant. I became the uh, senior director of quality for a big company with 45,000 employees. And I worked there until I was 70 and then retired. So then retired, people would ask me, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, you know, Monday I go to Pilates, Tuesday I go to yoga, mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday I do high interval training, um, and uh, Thursday night I have a poker game. My wife said, David, this really doesn't sound very good. You really should do something a little more, a little more substance. <laughs> and then two things happened. Um, I met someone from my, my 50th college reunion who said, David, you used to be an activist. What are you doing now? And then I met Richard Emery, who had just written a book on climate change. And I began to look into climate change and focus on it. And I found the Maryland Climate Leadership Academy. And that I understood. There was a certification program. There were a set of classes. There were some exams. And I joined that program. It was really a low cost, actually, the state of Maryland paid half my tuition, which was only a few hundred dollars. And for probably about six months, I studied climate change. And I took the classes, I took the exams. I knew from my daughter that if you need to pass an exam and learn a vocabulary to make up flashcards, I probably had 500 to 1,000 flashcards by the time it was done. But frankly, it was not that high a bar. And what I come to you with is a suggestion for people in the quality field to get on this bandwagon. Um, this is good for us personally. It's good for the environment. It's good for the planet. And it's good for our businesses. So that's basically what my, my talk is going to be about. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that's how we connected through. Uh, I saw a post you made on ASQ and we're both longtime members. And so. Um, yeah, that was really intriguing to me because I, you know, feel the same way that, you know, the skill set that we bring to the table is um, unique and it's much needed, even after decades of these methods and concepts being out there and people being aware of it. There's still a lack of application, I think, even in general settings and normal production and service processes. And now we see these bigger challenges going on and it's like, we need that same skill set over here yeah, with the same people who can facilitate those types of discussions. I was sitting in class um, learning about climate change and they were teaching as if it was brand new, as if it was a new invention, 
a five-step problem-solving model. <laughs> and, and this is something that you know quality have been using for 40 years right. and they were teaching like look at this wonderful model for for problem solving um and then the actually the noaa has a wonderful website and they lay out the five-step problem solving model applied to climate change and the first article i wrote for asq uh, laid that out said hey guys go to this website and you can see our quality technology applied to climate change is just laid out very nicely. Uh, so at that point, I realized, gee, ASQ could really um, benefit from this. Right. Yeah, very cool. I'll have to, uh, and I'll link to some of these articles and references you make um, in the notes here. So um, we'll get all that to people who want to go deeper mm -hmm. and check that out. Um, so tell me about some of the articles you've been writing with Quality Progress, which for those of you who don't know, that's ASQ's magazine that they put out. And give me a little background on some of those articles. So then after I received my certificate as a climate change professional, I can put CCP after my name and I have a certificate signed by the Association of Climate Change Officers and also by um, the state of Maryland. It's, uh, it may be licensed one day as a, um, just as, like we license um, people who do cosmetology and, and barbershops uh -huh. will be licensed. Maybe climate change professionals will be licensed. Um, but the certificate gave me the confidence to approach ASQ and, um, and write some articles, which I had done in the past. The first article was about um, the, the thing I just mentioned, the NOAA website. I wrote a total of five articles for ASQ. Two were rejected. And three were published. One of them was put on the cover of Quality Progress magazine, uh, and a second, a third article was one that they asked me for. The two articles that were rejected, interestingly, they were rejected. Why? Because they were about climate change. And the reviewers actually said, climate change is not a quality subject, and it's too controversial for <laughs> us. So we can think about that for the future. Um, the most recent article is um, Ask the Expert, and it was about how climate change can impact company stock. And I thought that was important because company stock in the, uh, when I was doing consulting, and, and certainly when I was an inside man doing uh, uh, quality for this big corporation, um, we all knew company stock. We knew the price of company stock, and we knew and this is what senior manage focused on. Yeah. for better or for worse. So when I came across BlackRock, which has 15, I don't know if I have the number of right, it's in one of my slides. I was gonna, I'm was i going to say 15 trillion, but let me just make sure I have it. It's a the big number, number right, I remember. <laughs> of managed assets, yeah, $10 trillion managed assets. Uh, Larry Fink, the head of it, and you know what, I'll just, at this point, I'll just pull this up okay, in great. case anyone is, is viewing this. Yeah, and if you're listening to this, we'll have a video link to the um, picture so you can reference that and look it up because it'll be hard to explain everything here. But um, so what? What the the quote from from the head of BlackRock, which when I do the workshops at ASQ, says every management team and board will need to consider how climate change will impact their company stock. So this is no longer becoming. Um, voluntary. Right now, the reporting in the SEC is voluntary, but it's going to become a required report where Wall Street wants to know if we're going to invest a million dollars or $500 million in your company, how will that impact company stock? Um, yep. My wife gave me an article. This is under the, under the Trump world where there was a, um, an oil company that was about to spend a billion dollars in uh, drilling in the in Alaska, and it was stopped. Well, why was it stopped? Was it stopped because the um, Native Americans chained themselves to the oil wells? Was it stopped because of regulatory? Was it stopped? Why was it stopped? It was stopped by the banks. Mm. The banks said, hey, guys, you know, I don't think we want to invest a billion dollars in more fossil fuels. 
And you know, we let's spend that billion dollars and invest in wind farms and solar farms. So I think that's what we're beginning to see. And that's a very important trend. It, it has become a political, you know, and a controversial topic. But if you look at the large companies, they're all they all have a sustainability report or or uh, social responsibility report that they're putting out because they're getting a lot of these questions and they're having to come up with a strategy and a plan around it. So um, whether individuals think there's controversy around it, the big organizations and most businesses with significant size have some kind of thoughts or at least uh, are putting together a lot of this planning around what they're going to do. Um, so and the business world, to me, I don't see that controversy. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward. Now, whether it's how we're going to address climate change versus pollution and stuff like that, maybe there's some focus that certain companies have, but I don't think there's denial that sustainability is an important topic in, in business today. But what I think what is lacking a bit is the, the plan. And how do you get to the plan? Is it just, let's throw out these ideas, or do we walk through a, a process of solving a problem like we would any other business problem. And I think that's where maybe there's some guidance that our, our skill set can provide. Mm -hmm. So so that's where I basically came up with this model here of five teams, I call it 5T, for dealing with this, this issue. And this is part of the, the talk that I've given to almost 30 um, ASQ sections over the past three years. So thinking about the how how could this be packaged and I, I, coming from a consultant's point of view, um, as I mentioned early on, um, we had this process to teach uh, quality engineers, voice of the customer. We put together a package, we put together an article, we called it customer window. We had a class and it, it basically gave me about a, a decade of consulting, maybe a little longer, maybe 15 years. Um, but the customer window, we service marked and we protected it. And every time we used customer window, we had our service mark. And it didn't get really widespread use because anyone who used that term had to come to our classes for better or for worse. So 5T is open source. It's not... It's in the common open source. Anyone can use it. Anyone can modify it. It's an open source concept. There's no other 5T around, and it's open source. So that was the approach. That was the approach here. And just as we have um, a Six Sigma, we have the seven quality tools. We have Deming's 14 points. We have Deming's five deadly diseases. Thought 5T would fit in well. And here are the here are the five teams. It's and this is in the quality progress article in January 2022, a strategy team, and I'll walk through what what that is, an adaptation team, mitigation team, reporting, and opportunity. So five T can be added to Six Sigma, to Lean, to to, to sustainability. It's an implementation model, and also it's a consulting model. I thought about how, as a consultant, you could you could manage this. As a consultant, you have five teams that have to be supported. They have to be trained. Um, then they do a project. Then they do a dashboard. Then they give a presentation. And this is very much similar to the quality models that we've used for so many years. So five teams. The first team would be a strategy team. And that gets to why address climate change? Why should our company, why should our organization address climate change? And of course, there we start with what uh, Fink said about um, co impact company stock. But also, you can begin with your personal climate story. And those of you who attend the Al Gore training, which is called Climate Reality, which will be part of the links, this is free training available, and you can become a a climate reality leader, and there's a process to go through. And part of that process is to write a story about your personal climate change story. And frankly, when I first was given the assignment, I went like, gee, I don't have any climate change story. And I had to think about it a little bit. And I realized that I do have one. And it involves Hurricane Wilma and um, the path of Hurricane Wilma. It went through Florida. The eye of the hurricane 
was right over my mother's apartment in Delray Beach, Florida. And I talked to her on the phone. I said, Mom, the hurricane is coming. How are you doing? She said, oh, it's been raining for a couple of hours, but everything's fine. I went on my computer. I looked at the map, and I saw she was in the eye of the hurricane. I called her back, and the phone line was down. She described that the she heard a freight train, the noise of a freight train coming towards her as the eye came towards her. She quickly went out of her bedroom, in the bathroom, closed the door, and heard the windows being smashed, the mattress being blown up against the wall, everything in the apartment, a third floor corner apartment wrecked. And she barely survived at the end of the storm. She had to literally climb out uh, of her apartment. And I immediately went down to Florida, the first plane I could, and brought my 87-year-old mother back to Baltimore. Now, the insurance paid for the apartment. They just paid for everything. Of course, then they canceled our policy. <laughs> right. Wow. And, and my mom subsequently moved to uh, to Baltimore. So this is where we have to ask, do we have anything for ourselves and for our company? So has our company, do we as an organization have a climate change story? Have we had assets that are gone underwater? Have we have customers that we've lost? Have we had damage to the storms? Are we um, at risk of fire fire damage? There was a fellow who uh, I met and he had a company that did, um, they would take your documents and they would scan your documents. They were in the document scanning business. They were also in the document retention business and they had warehouses with documents and they realized that they were at risk for forest fires and brush fires. Mm. And they had to change their business model and digitize everything. And yeah. it became a profit center for them because they would go to companies and say, look, you can't store things anymore. You never know. You can't store papers. We have to digitize. And they turned it into a great profit center for them. So they were able to take this situation, as we'll see later, um, this is the opportunity team, and turn it into um, a, uh, a revenue source. So what is our company? Where are we susceptible? So that's the, that's the first question. In one of these workshops, we talked about that. Um, the other thing that we do in the workshops is we show a tape of uh, my hero, who is Saul Griffith. And Saul Griffith has been one of the leaders in this whole field. And his work um, is at yeah, Rewiring America. And when the Inflation Reduction Act was announced, I went to the press conference virtually, and there the senators personally thanked Rewiring America for the logic that was behind the Inflation Reduction Act. And basically the logic is this. America for the last 40 years has been trying to put a tax on uh, fossil fuel, on CO2. And every time it gets close, it's turned down. The fossil fuel industry is very powerful, very strong, and they win every time. And they've been able to, to scuttle that every time. So what um, Saul Griffith and his group came up with is instead of a tax on uh, carbon, let's do it with a carrot. We're going to give a tax incentive and other incentives when you decarbonize. And that's what the Inflation Reduction Act does. It basically says to America, if you can cut your gas line, if you can stop burning fossil fuels, we will give you a tax incentive for doing it. And Saul Griffith then has his 12 minute video that's uh, really wonderful and it'll be in the links and it explains yeah. that whole approach. And what I'm suggesting is that for your strategy team, you basically show the video you can show it at home and you ask the question, how will this impact our company? What are the implications for our company? If America is going to build a billion new machines and these machines are going to uh, be electric machines, we're not going to rely on fossil fuel. How will that impact our company for all sorts of ways? And then the book Electrify is in bookstores and that's written by Saul Griffiths. And I recommend that if you get into this field, this is one of the books that we read. Just as we read Dr. Deming's book, we should be reading this book. Okay. Um, 
So the first team is the strategy team. And I remember back in the old uh, quality circle days and the TQM days and the, when I was doing voice of the customer, we always would have a, a steering committee, some management team, management council. So that's team one is your strategy team, your management group. Find a manager who is predisposed. Run away and hide from climate deniers. Someone says, no, nah, you know, I'm not really interested. Ignore them. Get away from them. Um, I know in my career, I have often avoided senior managers. I actually had a a agreement with my with my boss at one point. There was a senior manager. I said to my boss, "Never put me in the room with Pat, because <laughs> if you put me in the room with Pat, and I have to talk about quality, I probably will be fired." And uh, my uh, my uh, my boss, Charlie C. Friday, who some of you may know, who's very active in ISO. 9,000, they always kept me out of the room. So certain managers avoid, go to the ones who are predisposed. So that's team one. Team number two is adaptation. How do we protect our valuable assets? So that's team two. What are the risks and how do we protect our assets? And, you know, you can have situations where there's water on the street. And I, when I was on vacation, I took pictures of, of Cambridge, Maryland. There's water on the street, but there was no rain. Hmm. Water on the street, but no rain. Well, how could that be? Well, they call that nuisance flooding. And it's basically sea level rise. So sea level rise for many of us is, is a real concern. So we have to look at, and this is what the adaptation team does, is you can look at the local planning documents and see what areas are subject to sea level rise. They're clearly shown by your local uh, planning agencies. And these are documents, they're available online. You can go find them. And in the classes that I took, I learned to do this. I learned to go to the, um, to the public databases and find these and then identify what adaptation means. And adaptation for sea level rise often means building a seawall at great cost, they work, mm -hmm. but they they cost a lot and you gotta build a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so a sea wall is an adaptation. It doesn't solve the problem. You adapt to the problem by building a sea wall. Uh, in one of my classes at the Association of Climate Change Officers, there was a, um, an engineer from the Army Corps of Engineers and she said, she's moving, she's moving to Texas. So oh, you're moving to Texas. How interesting. She said, the Army Corps of Engineers has a project for me there that will last the entire decade. And it's about building seawalls in Texas. So Texas is going to need seawalls to prevent sea level rise. Well, I've also so, seen, you know, where the focus around the adaptation aspect to having to plan and look at, you know, I'm close to Miami. And so they're looking at pump systems to try and deal with sea level rise. And, but they're like, we keep having to build out larger infrastructure to handle this, but the cost of laying out the sea, seawall installations and building that puts a, a financial number to the problem. And now people have to step back and say, whoa, how we're spending this much money to deal with this. What else could we do to maybe mitigate or prevent this from happening instead of just, you know, putting in this adaptation? And so I think that discussion is actually, it seems kind of like you're giving up, but actually it's a good discussion to get the focus back on what can we do right now so that this adaptation isn't so expensive and cost. I mean, it's going to be something we can't, we've already gone too far to stop, you know, things from moving forward, but maybe we can slow down the size and magnitude of this adaptation by right. talking about what, what do we need to do. And you can hear in the background, I don't know, it may be annoying and we'll, we'll have to we'll change the sites. But the, the lawn mowers, my, my, I live in a condo and, and they're mowing the lawn, of course, with internal combustion engines. So we have all this noise, let alone the pollution. And someday in the future, when we have electric vehicles and electric lawnmowers, and actually we probably can eliminate many lawns in general, yes, and let them grow naturally, use regenerative agriculture, we, we won't have as much noise pollution from these internal combustion engines. Oh, yeah. So let's say we have an industrial building and we're not ready to retreat from the coast. 
what can we do? And we see this in, in Baltimore, there's now a way of wet flood proofing your basements. You take the lower floors and you put vents in the building so seawater can come in, they will flood the basement. But the advantage is that if you, if you flood the basement, then the pressure of the water is not leaning against the wall. If you seal the basement, you have all that water pressure against the wall and that could cause uh, significant damage. So one of the adaptations is to wet proof your basement, take everything out of there. When the floods come, as we know they do now, let your basement flood. And then when the, when the storm is over, uh, drain the basement. So that's another adaptation. Um, at the beach, you'll see uh, adaptation. People move their air conditioning units up a level. You'll see them up on stilts. They'll mm -hmm. put the air conditioning, the hot water up on. So that, that's an adaptation. It doesn't solve the problem, but you adapt to sea level rise. I was giving a talk in California, and I had to come up with adaptation there. And there, the adaptation is to make your home fire resistant. Make your home fire resistant. And this is now a whole industry to make a roof that will be have fire resistant materials, to have a hundred foot defensible property line, to do things for your house so that it, it won't burn. And God forbid we're, we're hearing today the terrible fires in Hawaii, people yep. running to the ocean to yep. survive the fires. So this is adaptation. So the question becomes, what do we have to adapt? And in the uh, in the classes that I took, there were these tools for doing it. They introduced it like it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was a matrix. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've been using this quality for 20 years and they introduced it. Look at this wonderful tool we have. You put on one side, you put your locations, and then you, you rate uh, what is the risk of climate change. And then you put on this next column, you can, what are you going to do about it? And I was like, but these are things we know how to do. Yep. And these are things we can do. And we can be leading our companies in this area, or we can be bystanders, let it go by. It'll be done by somebody else. Believe me, it'll be done by somebody else. So quality people either step up to the plate, take some classes, learn about this, go for it, or someone else will do it. Believe me, someone else is going to do it. If you don't do oh, yeah. it, if we don't do it, someone else will do it. Right. So that's the adaptation team. The third team is the mitigation team. And this is the team. So for adaptation, uh, we can think of risk management. For mitigation, we can think of prevention. This is how do we lower the greenhouse gases that we emit. And right now, my electricity, my personal electricity in my home comes from a solar farm, community solar farm. That's how I get my energy. And my cost is actually lower than the standard price. So I actually save money and I get green energy. And I don't have to argue with my wife about air conditioning. It's like, oh, uh -huh. air conditioning is okay because it's all clean energy. So this is something that's now available. Get online for it. Maybe you can sign up or you have to go on a waiting list. So this is the mitigation team, how to lower the greenhouse gases. Now, you may ask yourself, what are these greenhouse gases? What is it? And I was sitting in class learning about this. And the instructor says, if you take a ton of coal, coal is 80% carbon, and you burn it one ton, you get 2.86 tons of carbon dioxide. I could not understand that. It was like beyond my imagination. In my brain, I could not understand how. If you burn a ton of coal, you get ash. And they're saying one ton of coal is equal to almost three tons of carbon dioxide in the air. You can't see. Hmm. So what does this mean? So part of what, what I had to do, and you'll have to do if you, if you go through this, is you got to Google everything. I had like 20 pages of Google uh, links as I studied climate change. I had to look everything up. I had to look everything up. So I looked up the atomic weight of carbon. Who knew? That's 12. Oxygen, 16. Two 
oxygen atoms and one carbon atom has an atomic weight of 44. Who knew that carbon dioxide had weight? And if you look at the, the smoke coming out of the my, my house, out of the vent, it's just this very plain, innocent looking white smoke goes into the atmosphere. We think nothing of it. But I learned to do the calculation. By the way, when I took these classes, I was think the I was the only one who did the calculation of therms. You know, they gave us a calculator to do, uh, to do the calculation, but I wanted to do it myself, and it wasn't that hard. But I took a thousand twenty. So I got my uh, my bill out from my utility, and I added up how many therms of natural gas I use every month for the year. I came up with one thousand twenty six therms. And then I did the calculation, which I'm very proud of, and it came out to 5.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide that go into the air for 100 years, mm -hmm. for 100 years. Then I went to the EPA calculator. I got virtually the same number, so mm -hmm. I was safe. Cool. So this is what we're, what we're faced with. So okay. what is this yeah, CO2? Okay. I was going to ask you, how does that translate to? How it is. So the way it translates is if we look back to the year 1800, before the Industrial Revolution, a photon would come from the sun, it would come to the earth, and it would be absorbed by the soil, absorbed by the ocean, or a lot of it would bounce back harmlessly into space. And this has been going on for a million years. It bounces back into space. Now, in 1850, we started burning fossil fuel. By 1900, we had significant amount of fossil fuel, nothing like today, but still the photons would bounce back into space. But by the year 2000, we've now been burning fossil fuels for 150 years, and a lot of it. Mankind has been very good. And actually, the fossil fuel industry, although we think of them as bad guys now, they were really good guys. They created massive wealth. They created wonders for us. They did a fabulous job. And we, you know, at great risk, they went all over the world and they sought out fossil fuel. They drilled it in the desert, in the in the ocean, in the in the Arctic, and they worked hard. They did dangerous things. They were smart, they were intelligent, they built this fantastic infrastructure, and we have to give them credit and thank them for it. However, 40 years ago, they discovered, hey, this is not such a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it. So there, the fossil, the photon, instead of bouncing back harmlessly into space, will hit one of these molecules, and the molecule will begin to vibrate. Heat, as I discovered, is the motion of the molecule. So as the molecule moves, it has more energy, and that's that's where the heat is. And it will throw off that uh, photon and it'll either go back to Earth or go into space. But more of it is going back into the Earth, going back to the Earth. And we call that the greenhouse effect. And then in the last 20 years, we have more of this fracking gas, which is CH4, which is methane, and that is even worse. So um, that's what we're up against. And you can see clearly the data shows that as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, measured in parts per million, global temperature goes up. They go up right together, uh, side by side, and you can see the graphs. And actually, this was the chart that uh, ASQ did not print. Um, I had a whole cause and effect diagram showing uh, carbon monoxide, car carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for 800,000 years, and the graph peaks up like this. And it's a famous one that Al Gore shows in his in his old film. And that is the charts. And it was just a big cause and effect diagram with very little text. Um, and they refused to publish it. They said it was too controversial. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're up against. That's the science. So what mitigation is, and here's an example, like a store like Target will put solar panels on the roof of their stores. And that's mitigation. They're now producing their own energy and they're lowering their carbon footprint. And we see all sorts of efforts like that. And that would be a question for the organization. How can we mitigate our footprint? And there are all sorts of ways of doing that. So how are we doing? Ready? Should I continue on with- yep, uh, we got, uh, I have a hard stop at the top of the hour. 
20 minutes, but I think we're on good okay. track. Looks like if okay, great. 15 minutes, so and I hope, we'll do kind of a close up. I hope anyone driving in their car and listening to this while they're exercising is finding it uh, of interest okay. and uh, stay with me. Yeah. So the fourth team, and here again, teams, because we, we know how to work with teams. Yep. That's where we can be effective. You can do so much by yourself and then you need a team. And we know how to work with teams. We can make teams effective. So the fourth team is the reporting team because this is we're going to have to report our emissions. Our organization is going to have to do this. I was in New York City recently and the buildings would have a little plaque on the outside. You know, they have a little restaurants have a plaque. How is the health department A, B or C? How is the the cleanliness. Well, now the buildings have a, a, a CO2 emissions um, document on it, and they have a rating for how how effective is this building at their uh, CO2 emissions in New York City. And we're going to see that. Uh, Washington has that also. Wow. Um, Washington, D.C. So we're going to see that all over the place. So there's going to be reporting. So this reporting now fundamentally for reporting. So here is here is what you need to know about reporting. Go back to 1992. This is when the United Nations would hold these annual meetings. And in 1992, they met in Kyoto. And the host nation usually does some extra work. And the Japanese were right up on their game. And they identified the greenhouse gases. And they documented them. And they set up a measurement. The measurement is called the global warming potential. So we, you know, we're, 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 we're scientists. In the quality world, we're scientists. So we can understand this global warming potential, GWP. They set the GWP for carbon dioxide at one. And then they looked at all the other greenhouse gases, the main ones. So methane has a GWP, a global warming potential of 21. It is 21 times more impactful on the environment, bad for the environment, the carbon dioxide. That's what we call natural gas. Yep. And then nitrous oxide is 310 as a GWP of 310. So these are the greenhouse gases. And as you get into the field, you'll see a diagram. And I track down the diagram. It comes from the New Zealand Business Council. And it shows a cloud with these greenhouse gases in it, the seven greenhouse gases. And then the question becomes, well, how do we contribute? So the worldwide standard for this discussion is called scope one, two, and three. And this is what you'll see as you get into this. And this is something that we'll be able to deal with. Scope one are the emissions we produce ourselves. Our organization, our company produces from our manufacturing, our industrial, our service process is scope one. Scope two are the emissions from the grid, from what we buy from the outside, mainly from the grid. And that depends upon what your grid is. In some grids, they use more, um, more uh, nuclear. In Maryland, we have a fair amount of nuclear. So our scope too, when we look at it, the nuclear does not count for emissions, but the burning of coal, which we still do, and the fracking gas, which we do more and more now in Maryland, um, that counts as scope two. And scope three are the indirect, and this comes from our customer usage. I was on a, uh, a, a call yesterday, a conference yesterday, and um, there was a representative from Pepsi and a representative from eBay. And Pepsi was talking about distribution is scope one because they're the trucks that use for distribution. And eBay was talking about scope three is the shipping. And they're actually finding ways to encourage shipping so that you'll be shipping locally and they're trying to build in incentives so you'll do less shipping. You won't be so quick to ship by air from California if you can get something locally and let's say it takes a few extra days. So this is scope one, two, and three. You'll see this in the literature. And then the reporting is, and it's a simple uh, matrix with you have your scope one, two, and three, and then you have your different gases. And where do you get this data? Basically, you can get it from the purchasing department. It's not hard. You go to the purchasing department. I did this the other day. I, I'm in a, a, a condo and we have a gatehouse and the uh, we have a club clubhouse. And it said in the minutes of our 
condo association that we're going to replace the gas burner in the clubhouse. Well, I said, gas burner, you can replace the gas burner. You're going to put in another gas burner. And that's what they were going to do. And they set aside $60,000 for a gas burner. I went and met with the people and said, hey, wait a minute, let's put in heat pumps. What difference will it make? How much more will it cost? They said, well, let's see what it'll save. So I got the bills. It wasn't hard. They gave me the, the bills from the utility and I added up the number of therms that they used in the previous year. And it turns out 20 metric tons of CO2 in the atmosphere for a hundred years. I said, guys, do you want to do that? What's going to happen if the community finds out that you're going to do that? And they said, no, you know what? We're going to look for a heat pump. <laughs> <laughs> and then not only do they get the heat pump, but then we're going to sign them up for solar farm. So their heat pump will be run on a solar farm, community solar farm. So okay. that is the reporting. And there are a number of standards for reporting. There's an ISO 14064, and there are several other protocols for reporting. Um, and actually, let me say a word about this. Um, a very uh, widely used protocol is called the Global Protocol for Greenhouse Gas Emissions, GPC. And if you read that carefully in the document, I remember finding it was like on page 67, it says, use the quality management system to report the greenhouse gases. Use that system. And that's what they said it right there. They said, clearly they said, you've got this expertise, use it. And I'm talking to a fellow who's got a, a software program for doing this reporting and he's trying to sell it in the uh, ASQ community and he can't sell it. He says, no, not, can't sell it. I said, why? He said, well, the quality guys are not at the table. This whole huge measurement system, it's going to be documentation, it's going to be computers, it's going to be data collection. It's all being taken over by the finance guys. He said, they're at the table. They're the ones who are buying it. They're the ones. And you know what? It is, it is huge already. I can show you the companies doing it and quality guys aren't there. It's the finance guys are taking it over. Yeah, also on this reporting, um, now you said like right now, it's not really like required. However, I think what, what my experience has been so far is that it's the companies driving suppliers and saying, this is something we're getting asked about. And as we look at those scope three, and we start looking at our supply chain, we have to have a plan for them. And if you want to be a preferred supplier or a supplier at all in our organization, uh, you need to have a plan too. You, we can't just manage it at this scope one, scope two level and say, this is our responsibility and our suppliers is doing their own thing. And so when I worked at aerospace company, our customer said, you will do this carbon disclosure project. Right. Um, and then I'm working with a client right now and their customer is saying, you will do a sustainability reporting. And so I think, you know, whether there's something that comes out that's going to require it from like SEC or, you know, those who have public stock, uh, the customers are saying, this is something we're getting pressure on and we need to have a plan that goes through our entire supply chain. So I think that's mm -hmm. really cool to see that, that it's coming through the businesses. A lot of it's the, the it's required reporting through. or expectation of reporting. It's, it's like in the days where uh, I got a phone call one day, a fellow has a uh, bakery. He says, I have to do statistical process control in the bakery. I said, why? He says, well, because we sell to McDonald's. McDonald's says we need total quality management. And the Bill Atsko, who I mentioned earlier, the Deming protege, Bill and I, we went to this baker, we had a ball uh, doing statistical process control and really helped them a lot. So now we come to team five and team five is the opportunity team. How can we profit from combating climate change? How can we do something for us? We're capitalists, there's nothing, there's no harm in profit. And what can we do in that regard? And you can see there are simple things like target stores will put chargers in their parking lot so that you can charge your car while you while you shop. And that's an example of an opportunity. And a personal opportunity for everyone who's listening to this call is go to the um, Association of Climate Change Officers. You go to www.climateofficers.org and there is the class. 
and you can take this class, your company will pay for it. They'll pay for it gladly. They'll be happy to have you as a certified quality professional. Um, I remember back in the day, our company got, got bought by another company. And I was at that point, the ISO um, management rep. And uh, when I knew the company was going to be sold, I started thinking going elsewhere. But someone says to me, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And it turns out that one of the things the company wanted to buy was the ISO uh, management rep. <laughs> they actually valued us because that gave them some additional capability. So your company will be happy to have you as a certified uh, climate change professional. So I, I urge you to, to do that. So that opportunity, um, I have here something, if you want to see this opportunity in action, go to the Tesla Investment Day uh, on YouTube, and you will see an entire company focused on climate change, on making a profit from climate change. And I have no love for Elon Musk, but I do respect what Tesla has done. And that, you know, if you have an opportunity team, show them that video, show them what Tesla is doing. It's remarkable. And it's all about uh, making a dollar from fighting climate change. Very cool. Yeah, that was, uh, I like the way that you kind of laid out plan for people to go through and give them kind of a, a roadmap, you know, of mm -hmm. here's where you start out. I mean, if you're starting at the beginning and you don't really have a strategy, just like anything, whether it's a quality initiative or a safety initiative or, you know, you start with what's our plan? What are we going to do? Why are we doing this? What's our right. uh, burning platform, so to speak, mm -hmm. of yeah. why we need to do that? So whenever we run into challenges in the other phases, we come back to that and say, oh, yeah, this is why we're doing it. This is why it's important. Our customers want it. Our um, The local community wants it. Our employees want it. And it's good for business, right? If, right. you know, we talked about, you know, once you start reporting some of these things and you see that you're wasting electricity, that's money you're throwing away down the drain, you know? And so that's good for profits and it exposes waste in your process and opportunities to make your process more streamlined. So this, this isn't, um, hopefully people aren't viewing this as extra work, but it's more like refocusing on different aspects of your business that maybe you've overlooked or haven't seen in the past that are, is going to be good for your customers. It may attract customers, it may attract employees and it's hard time. It's difficult to find employees today, you know? So these, these are not, uh, hopefully they're not seeing this as negative, but as a positive way to get ahead of your competition and really separate yourself and do things more streamlined. So I think it's a win-win yeah. if you look at it that way. If you and if you're in the quality department, and, and this is something I felt personally, like what uh, until I had the certificate, once I had the little CCP after my name, I had the credential to to say something. But I often and I do these calls in ASQ, I'd be afraid of some of the questions I might be asked. Someone might say to me, Well, how did you do that calculation? What is nitrous oxide? Or some complicated question. The beauty of this field, frankly, <laughs> is that when you get a complicated question, you just turn it back to someone and say, well, please Google that and find the answer. Often, we don't have to know everything. We don't have to really be climate experts. We have to be process experts. And that is what we are. We are process experts. And we can really provide value as process experts to this, to this enterprise. We don't have to be bystanders. We can be on the team. They may be, you know, a sustainability department. Well, they're handling it. Well, we can be part of that department. We can be a, a, a team player with them. We can be a help to them. And this is something, even for your own selfish career opportunity to make yourself more valuable to your organization, this is something we in the quality field can do just to make ourselves more valuable let alone to tell our grandchildren. I, the other day, my granddaughter was introducing me to her new boyfriend. And she said, oh, this is my grandfather. He works in the field of climate change. You know, it made me feel like a million bucks. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's real and it's here and it's going to be here 
for the rest of our lifetime, for sure, for for totally sure. Yep. And I'd reiterate that point is when I started getting into this, you know, I, I had the same concerns that I don't know enough. So I went back and took some classes at, in college and got a sustainability certificate, but um, I probably delayed my engagement a little bit with um, thinking I had to wait to be knowledgeable and have all these information about global warming p- potential and all this stuff. I didn't really. I needed mm-hmm. to just bring the skill set I already had and I'll pick up and learn that as you go. But um, I would definitely tell people, just go and express interest to people in leadership that you think might have a, a sympathetic voice to what you're talking about and say, I'm interested in this topic. Don't know how I fit in but I want to, to move in this direction and just keep trying to insert yourself in there. Don't wait for an invitation and say, I'm going to hope that the finance team reaches out to us. They're probably not asked to be included. Say, I want to be involved and, and, and get yourself a seat at the table um, because they may not realize they need your help till you get in there. And then they're like, oh, wow, this is really helpful. You do have the skill set we didn't think about or no. So I definitely encourage people to, to step up and 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 go to your company and and talk and say this is something I'm interested in, how can I get involved? Um, and that's what I did, and I got a lot of opportunities out of that. We got to do some projects. We got to I got to be part of a corporate sustainability team, and um, it really changed my career path. But I had to step up, and and I, no one came to me and asked for my involvement. So I think that's what uh, a great recommendation. All right. Well, thank you. And and Brian, you have a wonderful website that I would urge everyone to go to. And hopefully that website focused a lot on Six Sigma will also focus on sustainability and it, it'll be a valuable re- resource to um, to quality professionals. Well, thank you. And uh, is there anything else, David, you wanted to share? You have a lot of great info here and we'll link to all these different resources you've got. I'll well, put your contact I'll information on there, your email and any other links you want to share. That um, one is certainly, uh, I'll be happy to talk to ASQ chapters via Zoom, uh, afternoons, evenings, whenever. I'll be very happy to do that. Um, and um, it's been a it's been a pleasure. I appreciate your calling on me and, and asking me to give this talk. And final is to say, uh, I urge everyone to step up to the plate. Don't be a bystander. Uh, get involved. And in the in the article in uh, Quality Progress on uh, on the company stock, there's a whole list of uh, movies and books and podcasts, yep. and you can really get up to speed pretty quickly in this field. Um, and it's it's very interesting. It's it's fascinating to see what we're going through, and it's a real challenge to to mankind. I mean, it's it's a, when they say it's existential threat. Yeah, they mean it's an existential threat. You know, it's it's like a real threat. And I, let me just maybe just close out with this. Think about um, is this an all hands on deck moment? And I'm suggesting it is. I suggested to quality ASQ that we change the name to quality and sustainability. And got actually a lot of pushback. But the argument that Saul Griffiths makes is that in 1935, America had 18,000 military aircraft. Six years later, we had 350,000 military aircraft in six years. How did we do it? We built up for World War II, the entire economy focused on the war effort. And that effort is what we need to do now. When we think about airplanes, we have to think about wind turbines. When we think about Liberty ships, we're building at one a week, we have to think about solar farms. When we think about com- communication, because communication was a key to, to World War II, the, the mathematicians and the breaking the codes and all that, we have to think about smart grids. And when we think about bullets, we need to think about batteries. And that is the that is what's at stake. And I have you know, in my in my hand, the battery of the future, the rechargeable batteries and rechargeable batteries 
are going to be a big part of our future. So we can do this. We did this before. We as a nation did it in World War II, and we can do it again. But it's all hands on deck. And join in. You'll be, you'll be happy you did. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, David.